Welcome to the International Workshop of Menachkin Lymphoma, taking place here in Scottsdale. And I have the pleasure to introduce you two speakers of the session on diffuse large B cell lymphoma. This is Rich Fisher, the president of the Fox Chase Cancer Center in Philadelphia. And uh, Christian Giselbrecht, uh, who is uh, from the Hôpital Saint Louis in France and well known for his trials in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So uh, we would like to give you some highlights on this session on diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And Rich Fisher uh, described how we identify patients with unmet medical needs. So how did you define these patients and uh, what do you think we can do about it to give them their needs? So the new results are that we, the good news is that we cure approximately 60% of all patients with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and therefore the bad news is that we have 40% who are not cured. And the question of this session is really how do we identify that group uh, before we treat them, uh, because we could come up with other options. And it turns out that's a very difficult question. There are multiple systems we could use to look at that. We could use things like the International Prognostic Factor Index, which still works. Uh, we could use the gene arrays, which define the cell of origin. Uh, we could do a variety of prognostic factor markers. The problem is that they don't clearly identify just that 40%. They have people in each of those categories that ultimately are not going to do well. So we're trying to figure that out. The, in my opinion, the only true group that we know that's defined easily is what's called the double hit lymphomas, or the CMYC with BCL2 or BCL6. The ones that have the translocation are only about 5 to 10 percent, and they do very badly, and we clearly need new therapy for them. The immunohistochemistry that defines the CMYC is about 30 percent, but that again overlaps a bit with the other classes. So in terms of tailoring a specific therapy, to start out with, instead of what we're doing, it becomes very difficult. And the other question we have to deal with, of course, is, as I frequently teach, just because we have a problem doesn't mean we have a solution. And so one of the things that's frequently talked about is, would we move to early, for example, stem cell transplantation? There's clearly data that shows that if you go to stem cell transplantation before patients are in CR, they don't do well. And the only real hope we have in that area is a recently published trial by us in the New England Journal of Medicine that said that the very high-risk patients with the IPI tended to do better uh, with transplant. But that was an unplanned subset analysis, so we can't push that too far. So we still have a problem defining these people, and we have a problem in terms of figuring out what we should do instead of that. Do you think that uh, the double hits are independent uh, risk factors and under different chemotherapy regimens? Because there have been recent reports published that uh, the double hit lymphoma is not always an independent negative predictive factor, depending on the chemotherapy and uh, immunotherapy regimen that you use. There may be a little bit of controversy about this, but in our experience, uh, they do badly and they're a small group and they have uh, really been homogeneous mechanistically and homogeneous in how badly they do, so I think it is a pretty good target. I think if you go to immunohistochemistry, that's true. And the other feature is they're a small group, so in multivariate analysis, whether they show up or not is really not a determinant always uh, of whether they're bad or not. I, I believe that they do badly under most of the regimens we use. Do you have any ideas what we can do about these double hit lymphomas? Well, we're all looking now, and there are now some new targeted agents early in development looking at a MYC inhibition. Uh, there are now BCL2 inhibitors, as you know, the ABT products are coming out. And I think at least one of the testable hypotheses now is that we can potentially uh, combine chemotherapy with these agents and begin to develop strategies to work. But we're not there yet, and so for the run-of-the-mill patient, not on a clinical trial, uh, there's really no great answer. The problem is that most of them don't go into a good remission, so they're never eligible for transplant, 
uh, in that regard, and uh, it, it's just a difficult situation today. Any new drugs you would suggest for this population? Oh, yes, yeah. quite, quite a lot of new drugs, and that's one of our problems because we are first to focus on the patient in relapse or with poor prognosis because the results are quite good in most of the situations. So now we have different uh, family. First, we have a new family of monoclonal antibody, either NAIC or immunoconjugate. Uh, they are uh, tested at the present time in randomized study, and it's too early to say exactly if we made some progress from rituximab. We can hope, but only confirmatory study can give the right explanation. Then we have some uh, new molecules uh, like a proteasome inhibitor, which will increase the efficacy of chemotherapy, but only in a subset of, uh, of patients. And that, uh, this subset of patients uh, is called the non-GCB subtype and not so easy to diagnose uh, as first-line treatment because you need the material. So, there is, once again, after interesting phase two study, a randomized study going on to test this hypothesis whether or not you can add this molecule to chemotherapy. And I have to point out that in all these situations, we need chemotherapy and another drug. And there is no new drugs at the present time able to give the same result than chemotherapy. Just want to remind you that uh, Despite the fact that it's active in solid tumor, the anti angiogenic factor was used in a randomized study for diffuse abyssal lymphoma without any success, although it's successful in other tumors. And more recently, thanks to the biology, uh, we are able to uh, describe the different pathways and uh, to focus on some uh, drugs to be added to chemotherapy. One is maybe quite general that uh, the linalidomide used in myeloma. It's active mostly, once again, in the non-GCB uh, subtype. And the other, very fashionable at the present time, the ibrutinib. Both of these drugs can be combined with chemotherapy. Encouraging results have been produced, but they need to be validated in a randomized study. So I will say that uh, it's not because we are lacking drug, but it's because all these drugs are not efficient enough and they have to be combined to chemotherapy once again. And maybe we will solve this problem and I can agree on the double E lymphoma because that's, uh, you know, the, the category uh, at least quite important. And when I look at the data, uh, the relapse patient distribution between GCB and non-GCB, it was half on each side. For the ABC, we know the biology behind, but in fact, most of this double hit will be in the GCB subtype, which is supposed to be good. So we have really to find something new. And well, Rich mentioned uh, uh, new drugs, uh, MIC inhibition, and maybe there is some way with the uh, inhibitor of the, uh, the BET inhibitor and uh, the Roma domain. We will see. And uh, I will think that uh, the clinicians, different groups around the world, uh, are making a lot of effort to put patients in prospective studies so we can bring the drug as quickly as possible to the patient. With so many new drugs coming up, do you have a strategy how we can define or decide which one we take first into clinical trials? And then how do we have to deal with the problem of combos, combinations? But it's a very difficult thing, as you point out. Uh, we now have the, the glorious situation of many new drugs that are active in FLOMA, actually too many for us to develop all the combinations and check them all. We don't have the patience and the time to do that. The easy ones are ones that have really blockbuster results that look extraordinarily good by themselves. But when you get the mid-level new drugs that are in the 30 to 40 percent benefit range, not good enough to replace other things and you have to do combinations. So there we're guided by the biology whenever we can be. We know differences, as Christian pointed out, between the ABC and the GCB. We make decisions based on that and, and by and large they've been pretty good to date on that result. But there is still a bit of empiricism here that has to be gone through. And uh, so we're looking for signal events that tell us that a given combination can be tolerated, since some of them are not tolerable, 
and they have a very unique thing. And I think the focus in aggressive lymphomas is always on the CR rate and always on curability. So the bar is very high in that regard. What do you think about uh, in vitro studies and animal models in uh, this respect? That means in selecting the drugs we should try first. So, you know, you use the best things you have. The animal models are not infallible. They're not perfect. They're engineered in different ways to respect different things. They don't have a human immune response in most cases. Uh, it's complicated, but at least it gives us some pathways and some discussions. We had a discussion this morning about one in vitro study that suggested putting two uh, BTK inhibitors or two uh, BCR pathway inhibitors might not be good. Uh, my, val my point on that is that we have to test that clinically and see if it works. We can't rely on that model. So they give us suggestions and hopefully we'll speed up the process, but they're rarely definitive in that regard. So Christian, I think your group was uh, very active and very productive and made a lot of contribution to the fact that nowadays less than half of the patients with aggressive B-cell lymphomas are dying compared to 15 years ago. So what would be your uh, suggestion in another 15 years? How many percent of the patients will be cured with diffuse large well, B-cell lymphoma? Well, I think you give so, some, if I take the young patient at the present time, I think we are close to 75, 80 percent of cure rate. And so the, the main, uh, if you use different uh, chemotherapy as a, and new drugs, so the main question will be for the more elderly patient where you can use all the tools at the same time. So we have to be very humble and to test a drug one after the other. I agree that preclinical models are important. When they are positive, at least it gives you hope, but that's not enough and you have to test them. And I am very often afraid to see studies starting very quickly on small study, you know, just because you have a sign of activity without waiting a large number to confirm uh, the result. And we have to be so careful about that. So I am not sure that I can give you the clue at the present time because we did a lot of progress in management, in dose intensity, and uh, we will see uh, for the future, and as you know, we have some study looking at maintenance uh, with lenalidomide in the elderly patient. We will start a study randomized with uh, lenalidomide up front uh, with low dose shop in the elderly patient also. So, and it takes about three to five years uh, to, to get the result, unfortunately. So I, th I think we all agree that uh, in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, we need phase three, phase three trials to establish a new standard, don't we? Yes, and, yes. The, and the, the yes. absolute point that Christian made, the population is getting older, and I'm now seeing for the first time since I've moved recently to Philadelphia, many more patients in their 80s coming in with lymphomas and they weren't even included in some of the early elderly trials we cut off at 80. So we're really entering a new era where we have to manage uh, those expectations. And another problem of luxury is that we have become so good that we need much larger trials, even ever larger trials to show a substantial improvement. And can this be done as it has been done so far, mostly on a national basis, or do we really need international efforts? Well, I think it's getting very hard. The other factor that plays into what you just said is that we're subdividing these diseases into different categories. So where we used to treat all of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, now we have GCB and ABC, and let's say they're 50-50 approximately. We've cut the sample in size. If we cut it down to triple hits, we're talking about 5 to 10 percent of all the lymphomas. We really need to find ways to do major collaborations. Okay. Thank you very much for this discussion and I would like to say uh, goodbye and hope that uh, we could give you some useful information on how we have to deal with the new drugs for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma.